Hello and welcome to the official AFC Bournemouth podcast coming to you as ever from Vitality Stadium. We're here once again to bring you closer to some of the personalities connected to the club, be it staff, players, former players or management. Now for those who are new to our podcast, my name is Zoe Rundle and I'm part of the media team here at AFC Bournemouth. Today I'm privileged to be in the company of the one and only Neil Perrett who's been covering the club for over 30 years. Now, Neil, the new season is just around the corner and we're really looking forward to being back in the Premier League. We certainly are, Zoe. You said 30 years. It sounds like a long, long time. I probably didn't think I'd ever see the club playing in the Premier League, so it's been a real privilege to have had five years of watching them already and now we're looking forward to a sixth season in the top flight. Well, talking of exciting, we've got a really exciting guest with us today who more than played his part in our journey back to the Premier League. He's recently surpassed 100 appearances for the club and there's no doubt that he is absolutely relentless. So without further ado, we're delighted to welcome Lewis Cook onto the official AFC Bournemouth podcast. Lewis, thanks for joining us. How are you? How's your summer been and and how are you doing? Yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. Obviously, um, I think the podcast is doing really well and stuff. I think you've had a few people on it now and... Yeah, I like just having these chats with you guys. So, um, me personally, I yeah, do really well. Pre-season's been incredibly tough, as it always is. Last year, I kind of did my own little pre-season, which was a lot easier than the lads. So, this year, I've been thrown straight back into it, and it's uh, it's been it's been good. It's been really tough, but beneficial for us all. Well, we're going to start with something quite light-hearted and and very topical, nonetheless. And that's with our brand new away kit. Now, you were seen modelling our new away kit. What are your thoughts on it? Yeah, my first initial thought was it's it's very different. Um, I've seen I've seen what they've tried to do with the the, with the palm trees and the nice colours and stuff and putting it on the other day for for the for the photos and the reveal. I think the overall feeling for it was was really positive. Having it on felt really comfortable in it. Felt like it had a bit of flair, a bit of bit of difference, and looking forward to wearing the season. Are we going to be expecting you to take one of those deck chairs home for your back garden? Yeah, potentially. Obviously, um, I think it'll go well in the garden. We're actually trying to do it at the moment, so uh, it could be a good addition. I actually went to the coffee shop today and there was one sat in there, so just let everyone know that that's my chair no one can sit on it, which is, uh, which is funny. Going to go right back to the start, Lewis. You were born in York in February 1997. Did you ever have any affinity to York City, a club which has been through the mill, certainly during your lifetime? Not really. Obviously, being born in York, I was from. A, I grew up in like a little village outside, kind of in between Leeds and York. Um, I think my dad took me to probably my first football game was York City. Um, so yeah, that's probably the only affiliation I've had. Um, when I was at Leeds, we we played a few pre-season games there. That's probably another thing. But apart from that, no, not really. Just played there a few times, and like I say, it was my first first game I went to. Now you went to Tadcaster Grammar School. Former pupils include ex-pros and current players David Brown, Mark Ford, Ross Greenwood, Matthew Kilgallen, Rory Watson and Charlie Taylor. Have you crossed paths with any of them? I know that you played with Charlie Taylor, didn't you? Yeah, obviously um, a few of the older players haven't really come across them, I don't think. Whereas Charlie Taylor, yeah, was a year above me, uh, a couple of years above me, about two or three years above me. Uh, Rory Watson was the year above me. So yeah, know him really well, um, went to a few... Had a few kickabouts in, at school and saw him quite a lot. He's a really good guy. Um, we actually came through at kind of the same age at Leeds as well. So, yeah, I know I know him. But, yeah, Tad Grammar School was great great for me. It wasn't actually a grammar school, which I always tell people. They just kind of held on to the name when it used to be a grammar school because I, I definitely wasn't clever enough to get into one of them. But, no, they were great to me. Helped me make sure I balanced football and, and school as well, which is massively important. Now, John Smith, the founder of John Smith's Brewery, is another old Tadite who went to the school based in Tadcaster have you ever had a tour of the brewery I've actually never had a tour no I think a few of my family members used to work there um, because I've got a lot of family in Tadcaster but um, no I've never had a tour I've had a few of the beers um, probably a couple at the local pub where all my uh, family and friends go to that's kind of the the only beer there so I've I've tried one of them before and yeah it's uh, smooth going back to your school days what were your best and worst subjects so yeah, school was hard because obviously you used to miss a few days, day school, which was uh, which was tough to try and get the, the the grades in. But like I say, Leeds were very good with me. They made sure if I wasn't doing my grade, getting my grades, I wasn't allowed to go and train as like with the first team and stuff and the days off. But um, probably my favourite subjects, I think everyone would say PE, wouldn't they? As a as a as an athletic person, PE was definitely up there. I used to love geography just because of the teacher who I had was was great with me. He's called Mr. Bittles and. Keep in touch with him now and stuff, and he was he was top. And 
Mr. Walker was also uh, the PE teacher who was great. So they were definitely my favourite geography and, and PE just from the um, the worst one. I don't know really. I, I really enjoyed school. I really enjoyed seeing all my friends and actually going to lessons and stuff. So it's something I, I really miss. So I couldn't really tell you which was my worst subject to be honest. Didn't Obviously, it must have been a bit difficult playing football, going to school, especially in the later years. Did you leave with many, many qualifications? So I could have got the maximum I could have got was eight GCSEs, and I got I got eight, um, eight, eight to C, four Cs, three Bs, and an A. I think. Which I remember going to my head of year and was like, oh, Lewis, I think I think you could have done a little bit better. You haven't failed anything, but I think you could have done a little bit better. So then, yeah, the sheet folded over with my results. I was just like, give me that here now. That's that's all I need to know. So yeah, I was I was delighted with what I got. To be fair, and yeah. Now York is synonymous with horse racing have you ever been to the Knavesmire yeah so the Knavesmire actually when I was at school tag, tag, I used to start I was doing running races so I used to do 1500 metres um, and yeah we actually ran that was one of the races once around the Knavesmire I think it was there's like two there's a massive one and there's a smaller one so that it was it was like three four laps of the smaller one and I remember I always remember it I was it's the first time I've ever done an actual running race and I led the whole way around, the whole way around. I was, there was this person right behind me and I led the whole way around and on literally the last, I'd say 20 meters, I was slipped and I was, I was knackered, but I slipped and he ran past me and I came second. And I remember his parents coming to me after saying, oh, how long have you been running for? And, and I was like, oh, it was my first race. And he went, cause he'd been running like, that was just what he did every day. You know what I mean? Every, every weekend he'd go running and stuff. But um, no, that's probably the nays, my, that's my last, Last time I went on there, I'd say. I know how that feels, um, <laughs> Lewis. We in the FPL league last season. I was in the lead every single week except for the last week when I got overtaken. <laughs> oh, it's horrible, it's isn't it? Anyway, idea. how did you first get into football? So I, it's hard. I, I don't actually know. I think, I think one day my mum just and my dad just got me a pair of boots and said, "Oh, why don't you go try this down at Tagcaster um, Basili?" It was a little. I, I get that wrong sometimes. I think it was Basili or Tad Magnets. I'm not too sure. I think I was about five or six. And yeah, they got me a little pair of Sondico boots. And I went there and I decided to go in net for some reason as a keeper. And parents like, during the game, they was like, what are you doing? What are you doing? And uh, I think my boot fell off and I started crying on the pitch. Like, I, d I obviously wasn't enjoying it. So then the guy was like, put your boot back on, go play outfield. And as soon as I went outfield, I was just doing my thing, scoring goals and everything. So that was probably how I got into football. And ever since then, I've always, I've always wanted to, to play. Any relatives, sporty family or anything like that? No, not really. Not, not that I know of, no. I think I'm the only one who just, it just happened really natural to be fair, football, even all the way through. It was never pressure on me to, to, to perform at young ages and get into uh, academy. It was just, just make sure you have fun. And I got scouted when I was about six, and obviously you have to wait till you're nine to sign your first little contract. And yeah, from then it's just always been the same lead. It's always been like progressive, just playing football. And luckily I got to where I am. So you, as you said, you were, you were signed by Leeds and you made eye-catching progress through their academy, often playing um, ahead, of your, ahead of your age groups. Tell us about some of the players you came through the ranks with, maybe who you still you know, speak to nowadays and have done well themselves or maybe not. Yeah, so obviously I played um, when I signed at nine with a few of my friends from my school and stuff, and we had a great group. Um, but like I say, it's really hard to, to get, get professional, and, and not many of them made it really towards the end. As I got to about 13, 14, you got the likes of Alex Moat, Calvin Phillips, Sam Byram, Charlie Taylor. So yeah, a great group of, of, of people. We had Louis Coyle as well, who's at Hull at the moment. So we've got a lot of players that are playing at a high level, Premier League. Obviously, Calvin's done incredibly well with England and stuff, and obviously Manchester City now. So, yeah, just all I can say is it was a it was a great time to be at Leeds as a young player coming through. Even throughout the academy, I had a lot of coaches and managers that were just great. So, it was a really family family club similar to Bournemouth, and yeah, it was a it was a great great upbringing. Now, jumping ahead a bit, in May 2014, you were part of the England squad, which won the European Under 17 Championships. Obviously. Dom, Slank Dom Solanke scored some important goals. What are your memories of him in that tournament, his game now, and, and how do you think he's going to fare in the Premier League again? Yeah, it was such a long time ago. I think 
I think Dom's always had top top quality as we've we've all seen. I think I think I think he was playing in the ten then. We were playing like a, a two in midfield and a and a one one in the ten, which was Dom. And I think he's is what stands out from then was his hold up play. I think you could just wrap it into him, you could bobble it into him, he'd always wiggle his way out and, and, and link up the play and obviously scored a lot of goals as well. So no, Dom's always been top, I've always known that and I'm just glad he's especially last year he was he was on fire, so yeah, it was a great time for us all as young players and that kind of propelled me into going on my first pre-season tour. So it was massive for me, that tournament. Following that tournament, you started both games as Leeds did the double over Bournemouth that season. Obviously, Bournemouth went up to the Premier League for the first time. What are your recollections of those two games? I think it was 3-1 here at Vitality Stadium and, and 1-0 at Elland Road. Yeah, I can't really rem- I don't really not want to really vividly remember games. I don't know why, I just kind of move on to the next one but I remember especially the one here just I think it was the centre-back Belushi scored a free kick um, never scored a free kick in his career I don't think but he was quite a strong character and decided he wanted to take it and he put one straight in the top corner to be honest and kind of just remember sliding in front of the in front of the fans the Leeds fans at the time and it was it was good and also I think I remember the first half maybe not playing too well and getting a little bit of a um, a G up is our a little bit of a telling off at half time and propelled me to play better in the second so no it was a it was a it was a great game and at that time I was happy we won. You might not remember as you say but on the back of those two games do you think Bournemouth will go on to win the championship that year? I don't really know I think obviously because we at Leeds at the time we were I think we were in and around not the bottom but like the bottom half and Bournemouth were, I didn't really look at the table to be honest so I didn't really pay much attention to what what you guys are doing but looking back and seeing like you know when you've got they've got all the clips of what's it called the uh end of season dvd yeah yeah i think yeah they were a top top team and scored had great players great identity and stuff and just run away with the league to be honest so no, i can see how how they got up then a couple of leeds games we'd like to um get your thoughts on the first one being your debut against Millwall in August 2014 you were 17 came off the bench and I think you gave away a penalty yeah so I think it all started driving up to the stadium on the bus and obviously it's my first first game and yeah it was crazy like the smack, smacking on the bus and all that and shouting all sorts of words and that was great and yeah I came on for like 20 minutes ball's gone to the edge of the box and he's he's kind of dink, like dinked it and I haven't touched him at all. He's completely dived, and then he's given a penalty. Yeah, so I think it was a great, great learning curve. I'd say maybe, or just a good experience to be honest as a young player. And yeah, luckily I started the next game and did well. So after that, it was all history. But yeah, he dives, so it's it's not ideal. Have you ever dived to win a penalty, Lewis? No, I'm not very good at it. I can't. I don't have a knack for it. I'm not really much in the box anyway. So, but yeah, don't. Uh, not really a diver. However, you are a snorkeler. Just tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I don't know. If I've said that before on a podcast, but yeah, when I go on holiday, it's my favourite thing to do. Pretty much always in the water. So I try and go to nice tropical places and see different kind of fish and sharks and octopuses and stuff. So no, I actually love it. I think if I, if I wasn't a footballer, I think I'd definitely be like a marine biologist or something. Seriously, I, I really, really enjoy it. Well, what got you into that? Tell us. I don't know, I just went to the Maldives one day. It was the first time i ever gone snorkelling. So I kind of killed it for myself, really, because I can't go down to Bournemouth Pier and see manta rays and sharks and all that. You could probably see some sharks, but yeah, I just I just loved it. I just like, I love being under the water. I like trying to go hold my breath for as long as I can and just pretend to be a fish. W- would you now choose to go on holiday somewhere where you can go snorkelling? Yeah, definitely. I've been to a lot of places now, so there's there's... there's Obviously, a lot of other places I can go, but I've pretty much seen a lot of the stuff I can see. So it's just more like coral and stuff now. So I went to Bora Bora in the summer, and that was the best place I've ever been for that. So maybe I'd maybe one day when I finish football, I'd like to do a bit of scuba diving, maybe in England, do some shipwrecks and stuff. I think that's probably the closest thing I can do here. I'd like to do that one day. Doncaster Rovers away in the Carabao Cup marked two firsts for you. Your first career goal. And one instantly forgettable moment, your first and only red card so far. Tell us about that game. Yeah, so I think I just tapped one in back post. 
done this weird celebration because I don't really know what to do when I score. So I kind of put both arms up while I'm running and I'm pulling his weird face. So yeah, that was a great moment. And then I think it was like 20 minutes later, maybe a bit less. I'm just running with the ball and I took it around this person. He's kind of knocked me off balance. So I'm running off balance. But, and do you know when it's like quite a big touch and you're like wincing if you to go for the tackle, whereas I've just, both legs have come round and I've kind of scissors him. But again, I haven't really touched him. I've just gone through through the middle of him and the referees pro probably rightly sent me off. And I just made sure I was all right and just walked off. And then when the manager came in, I really got a telling off. I had to pay for a team meal, so. <laughs> Only 17, so it was, it was quite a lot of money for me. What, he made you cough up? How much was that then? Do you remember? How much, I think it was what like was eight, it? I think it was like 800 pounds, yeah. <laughs> and that was a lot, of, like, a lot of money. It is a lot of money, but. Yeah, I think he was just more frustrated that it was three games banned. So, but it's it's not like I did it on purpose. It just looked really bad on the on the video. Now you won a couple of prestigious awards in your first season as a pro, Championship Apprentice of the Year, and Leeds Young Player of the Year. Did you think that first season had gone better than you'd expected? Yeah, definitely. I, I think I just put it down to like when you come through as a as a as a young kid. And you're playing with other like your mates and stuff. You don't really think too much into it. You just play football. Whereas uh, as your career goes on and you have highs and lows, you start to really think about everything and trying to do everything right and stuff. Whereas then I was just literally playing football. And I think, yeah, probably went a lot more, a lot better than I expected. And yeah, thankfully I just I won a few trophies that year and yeah, it was a great time for me. So you had another stellar season, 2015-16. You won the EFL's Young Player of the Year award. You won Leeds' Young Player of the Year award. And you won the club's goal of the season. Talk us through that goal. Can you remember it? Yeah, I can remember that. I think that was a... It was, I still can't believe that went in, to be honest, thinking about it. Obviously, it was Fulham at home. And, yeah, the Moat's running down the line. Probably, like, just gone past the halfway line. Um, and he's just passed one into me. It's kind of like the worst pass ever. It's bobbling up and that, up, up and down. And I've just took a touch, and it's still bobbling. And I've just looked up. I don't know. It must be not like thirty-five yards out. And I've just hit it, and it's gone. It must have gone about five meters above the crossbar. And I'm thinking, oh, it's gone over. And it just dipped last minute and just went over. I saw the keeper go over with his arm. And yeah, I couldn't really believe it went in. To be honest, it was it was a crazy goal and something I hope I can do again one day. 35 yards out what made you hit it I don't know I think I don't score many goals but every every goal I've scored it's always been you've never I've not thought about it much so it ju I just did it so I don't really know why I did it and I think I got a chance like 10 minutes later to do the same thing and I tried it again and it just didn't work and all the fans were laughing and stuff so I think we drew 1-1 in the end though so Wikipedia describes you as a goal scoring central midfielder <laughs> with four goals in 214 games that's uh, that's quite generous of them, isn't it? Yeah, I think they must have the, the, the cameras from training, to be honest. So when I do the shooting drills, I'm a top top scorer. So um, yeah, maybe they've they've got a little little inside guy. Is there ever an, an element of frustration with your goal scoring record? Um, it's hard, really, because the way we've played in in past teams, it's 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 quite hard to get forward and score goals, you know. But no, I don't think so. I think I'm just happy playing football, playing games. I'd like to have scored more goals. I feel like I definitely can. Um, but yeah, I just need to probably shoot a little bit more and just be a bit more selfish and yeah, hopefully some more goals can come. Someone you've played alongside, former AFC Bournemouth skipper Jason Pearce, he was at Leeds as well. He remains extremely popular here at the club. What are your memories of playing with him and him as a character? Oh yeah, Pearce, he's, I can see how he's still so popular. He's top man, top, top player, top pro. Um, big family man and like, when I was younger he was he was great with me and stuff and I just always remember him in boxes he's got his big his black boots on and you're doing little rondos and if, you, if he gets that inch that he can take the, the man and the ball he'll do it and he's just always, always upbeat a real driver in the team training standards never himself drop below below anything so yeah he was a, a top top guy and I think he's is he retired now I think so so yeah, he's had a great career as well. Now, in two seasons in the first team at Leeds, you played under no fewer than six different managers. What was that like for a young player? Because you were only young. And just tell us, what was it like playing under Steve Evans? Yeah, I think 
it was it was it was weird because obviously as a young player in your first two seasons, that many managers you think, oh, is this normal? You just and luckily I was still I was still playing, so I just was trying to concentrate on my football. I think I used to say in, in interviews when I was younger at the time, I'd just keep focusing on football and whatever happens in in the back, just kind of put it to the back of my mind. And I guess in, in one hand, it's I've had a lot of different managers and got a lot of different views on football, different styles of play. On another one, it could have been a bit more smoother for me. But like you say, I was I was playing and enjoying my football no matter what. We've heard great things about Steve Evans from Steve Fletcher here, who let him leave Crawley to, to come back to Bournemouth. We we only really see him on the touchline and you know like a caged tiger. Well, what is he actually like, sort of in the changing room, if you like, on the training pitch? Yeah, he's a he's a he's a he's, a, he's, a, he's definitely a character. He's a he's a funny guy. He was uh, always cracking jokes, and I actually think he did quite well at Leeds when he was there. Um, got a few good results and things, and yeah, he was just he was just always always making jokes, but. Say at half time, if you'd if you'd been losing and stuff, he'd come into the into the changing room, take his jacket off, do a couple of strides, and you could tell someone was about to get it. You know, he would go right in your face and and tell you if you, if you're not been performing. So, which is fair enough. All managers are different, and some players need that. But um, yeah, he was a he was a character, and I enjoyed working with him. Six years ago, you made the decision to come and join the Cherries. Just tell us what was behind the move, how it came about. To be fair, it's, it was it was all a bit of a blur. I think I was only young and I was playing a lot of football, and this this came available. And I wouldn't say it was kind of out of my hands, but it was kind of done. It wasn't really my choice. If they wanted to sell me, they was gonna they was gonna sell me. So yeah, I was just real nervous. Never had anything like that happen before. And I remember just being on pre-season at Leeds, and I was so nervous and. They were telling that I think they had to end up. My parents had to tell me that I wasn't happening and stuff, so I could just not be so nervous. Um, but then, yeah, next thing I you know, I'm just leaving, saying bye to everyone, and yeah, getting a plane from Dublin at the time to to here, and then got here, and everyone was fantastic. And Premier League was a massive draw for me, and just loved loved being here. And like I say, it was a massive family club, and we've had a lot of uh, success. Must have been a bit of a wrench, though, because you're leaving behind everybody virtually. Yeah, it was. It was. I'm not going to say it was easy. It was the hard, probably the hardest thing I've ever had to do. Um, not just my family, but obviously the fans there. Are, you see, you see them now. They're a, a great fan base, and obviously coming through since I was six, it was. Uh, it was all a bit of a blur. It happened really quick, but probably didn't really get to say bye like the way I'd like to. But hopefully this year we can obviously play them and see how that goes. What was it like for a northern lad moving down south? Yeah, again, I think it's so far away, and it didn't really click until I had to make that drive back up to see to see my family. I think it's four hours, but now I've been here for six years. It's it's honestly one of the best places, definitely in England, and I'm so settled. And me and my wife love it as well. So, are there any similarities between York and Bournemouth? No, I don't think so. I can't think of any to be honest. I think the only thing I could say is so say if I go for a walk down on the do you know Sandbanks Beach where the chain ferry is and you look over where the the ferry goes and you see all the fields and it's just green that's basically where I'm from so it's kind of, if I look over there it's like being at home I guess that's probably the only sim- similarity I could say a small reminder yeah. of home now you made your Premier League debut in a 3-1 defeat against Manchester United now despite the result it must have been an extremely proud moment for you I think you were 19 at the time yeah, definitely. I think obviously it's everyone's uh, every kid's dream to play in the Premier League. Watch yourself on match of the day, even if we did lose uh, at the time. Lining up in the in a tunnel and just look to your right, and Wayne Rooney's there and stuff. And you watched him when you were younger in England. And yeah, again, it, ha- it, it all happened so quick. It, when I think back, it's just a bit of a blur again. So games come so thick and fast, and you, you tend to forget those moments. And looking back, I probably should have. Should have remembered it a little bit more and, and took it in a little bit more. But yeah, it was a, for me and my family, it was massive and yeah, very excited. Now, how would you assess that first season? Because I think you had an ankle injury, Jack Walsh came in playing time, perhaps wasn't how you might have liked it to be. How, looking back, would you, you know, assess it? Yeah, I think obviously that first game, I think I came out of the team this, the second game and didn't really, as a young player, I probably should have asked a few, a few more questions because I think in the game, I 
done all right. I didn't do anything special, but I, I played all right. And, and then a few weeks after that, I got my ankle injury and I was out for about three months. And then, yeah, it just took a while to get back into the team. I think it took me till the last six or seven games to get back in the team. And we won about five or six of them, actually. Um, and then, yeah, I think it's just part of football. I was young and I think that, that year after my ankle injury was a massive year for me. Um, Eddie Howe at the time, we worked, worked a lot with, lot with me uh, individually and made me look at football a lot differently. So I was happy with how that year went in the end because it kind of sets you up for the next years after that. We, we were going to mention the very strong finish you had to that season. Yeah. Some very, very good results there. I remember Sunderland away, sending them down. And, but you, you missed the last game of the season away at Leicester because I think that might have been the England duty. Yeah, so, yeah, I played the last... I think I think the gaffer at the time said he wants me to just uh, miss the last game so I can go go away because obviously we were safe at the time. So I, can, I, think it was, I think it was to go away before I went away. So I could have a little bit of, of time because obviously we had the the world was it the World Cup? Yeah, we had the World Cup coming up. So yeah, I just took that time to have a little bit of a break, and yeah, that that summer went really well. Now the big one. Not only were you selected for England under twenties for the under for the 2017 under twenty World Cup, but you were made captain as well by Paul Simpson. Just tell us that must have been a, another proud moment for you. Yeah, it was definitely. I think that was the first. I think it was the first time I'd been captain. I'd always tried to, when I went away with England in the youth team, I'd always not keep myself to myself, but I'd always try and be professional and do do set the right standards. So I think that was probably why I became the captain. Not necessarily a big voice in the changing room or a big voice on the pitch, because um, when you're away on international duty, especially for like three weeks, you kind of have to. It's hard to to maintain. You know, a few of the lads might get a little bit bored and want to try and do some different stuff and have a bit of a laugh and stuff and it's it's hard to, to maintain it so I think that was the main reason I became captain but yeah it was a, amazing amazing for me especially captain my country at that time and, and winning some a trophy so you played six of the seven games including the final against Venezuela and you became the first England captain since Bobby Moore in 1966 to lift a world trophy what was going through your head when you lifted that trophy aloft I think it was just it's just pure excitement. Obviously, I wanted to make sure I got the right. You know, you get the trophy, you, you you try and hold it down for about ten seconds, and then bring it up and get the right cheer and stuff. So that was kind of playing. Didn't want to drop it or anything like that. But no, it was just delight for for the staff and the, and the players and the families as well, because a lot of families were out there as well. And yeah, it was it was a, a great moment. Now, following your exploits that summer with the under twenties, you. You really enjoyed a breakthrough season here in the Premier League. 29 appearances as the team finished 12th. Wins against Arsenal and Chelsea in the January stand out. I know they do for supporters. After the previous season, when you hadn't featured as much as you might have wanted, that must have been a really satisfying season for you. Yeah, definitely. I look back on that now and and, realize, and, and think I really needed that season, especially for myself in the Premier League. And... Yeah, it was a it was a great time. I was loving my football and just loving playing on the biggest stages and yeah, playing a lot more. I felt like I'd worked hard to try and get there and yeah, like I say, I go back to saying it was everybody's dream and being able to see myself match the day a lot more was 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 massive. So great season for me and yeah, I just wanted to continue. Talking of every boy's dream, you formed that year and your call up to the England senior squad and you made your debut against Italy in March 2018. I think you were also put on standby for the World Cup squad that year, but what was going through your head when you replaced Jesse Lingard and do you still have that shirt? That must be somewhere special in your house. Yeah, that's, that's, that shirt's framed. I've um, got a few shirts framed and that was definitely one I needed to... But yeah, I think when I was just on the on the sideline talking to, to uh, Gareth Southgate and he was... I can't remember what he said. It was again. I'll go back to saying it was just a massive, massive blur. It was 20 minutes. Can't really remember anything from the game. I remember putting one left foot crossing, which was actually all right. And yeah, I think I just remember running onto the pitch and just thinking a little bit of a relief and just thinking, oh, I've actually done this. And then it was kind of just back to playing football and focusing on 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 things and stuff. But after was I was really happy and yeah, it was a again for me and my family it was a, a massive, massive moment. 
The international recognition kept on coming. You skippered England to glory yet again in the 2018 Toulon tournament. You were also named in the team of the tournament. What are the main differences for you between club football and international football? I think the first thing is, is it's, it's a lot different, especially in the youth ages. Is there's not as many fans and stuff. You can be playing on a, a random pitch somewhere. I think that tournament, the grass was about three metres long. And you just get this little, I think it was in Mexico in the final. I think it was Mexico in the final. You get this little kid who was just unbelievable, like dribbling with the ball and just loads of different styles of football. So that was probably the main thing I'd say from the youth ages was, yeah, it was it was fun, especially going away with the lads and stuff. And the contrasting styles in football was crazy. I remember playing Chile once when I was, I think I was about under 14s or 15s and they would just not stop running. It was crazy and they were just unbelievably fit at that age and it was just good to get a different, different perspective. Season 2018 started really well for you. You were all this international recognition you'd had. You'd had a, the previous season was absolutely fantastic. I mean, you must have been at the you were well, you were at the top of your game. We we could all see that. You must have been thinking nothing can go wrong here, and then, bosh, it all went wrong in December 2018 against Huddersfield with that ACL. Yeah, obviously a massive blow. But I think I go back to saying it at the the, the highest level, the elite level, everyone takes risk. You know, everyone's putting their bodies on the line and things like that happen. So look, looking back on it, it was a it was a really hard, really hard thing to deal with. And obviously, I wish I wish it never happened, um, but it's definitely made me stronger as a person. And at the time, I was devastated and stuff. Looking back, I didn't really probably figure out now that it was it, it impacted me a lot, especially like you say, I was I was playing and stuff, playing well and enjoying my football. But it is it happened now and I've I've got over that and. Look, I'm just happy to be back playing football. And last year was a was a big plus for me. It does happen a lot these days, ACLs. How important was it for you to have someone like Callum Wilson around you who had suffered a similar fate? Yeah, definitely. Obviously, Mingzi was there as well. He'd done the same. And yeah, Cal was great. Obviously, been through a lot as well with him. And yeah, gave me a lot of advice. And he really, really helped, especially at the early stages. So look, when, you, when that happens, I think you've just got to try and focus on becoming the best injured players you can be and you just luckily I, I say this I think I've said this before with, with my knee injuries there's always been isolated there's not been any other structures that have been damaged whereas some other people can, can do really really serious ones so that's always it's always helped and stuff to, to get back It wasn't all bad news during your rehab because in April 2019 you announced on Instagram your engagement to Loretta we saw pictures of you getting down on one knee and there was a headline, Lou Beauty. Were you nervous? Yeah, I think that was probably one of the most nervous I've been, to be honest. Um, I don't really know why. I shouldn't, have been, I shouldn't have been nervous. I was just... Where we did it in, in Italy, it was... We had to get, like, a, a boat across from one side of the key thing to the other and it came, like, round a mountain. And the side where we started from was raining. And as we came around the other side, it stopped raining, so I was... That was the only thing I was really nervous for, and it, it all worked out perfectly. And and I can't really remember what I said when I got down on one knee. I was a little bit nervous for that as well, just to try and make it all nice and stuff. So those days must have been a far cry from your first date with Loretta, which I believe was in a McDonald's. Just tell us about that. Well, yeah, obviously that wasn't just the day. I didn't. We didn't go straight to McDonald's. We went to town first and just <laughs> got on like a little a coastliner bus. I think it was at the time. Into town, went and did a bit of shopping and stuff, and then. Loretta said she wanted McFlurry, so I took her there, and my mates were in there and took a picture of me. And then, yeah, that's that's how it how it came about, to be honest. Now I know that you guys met at school, and you could probably go on all day talking about how important Loretta has been for you in your career. You must have asked her to uproot when you signed here. That's a big decision for anyone to make. Just just tell us about how important a, a person she's been. Yeah, obviously, definitely. Since I've been, I think I was fifteen, she was. was yeah, 16. Um, yeah, she's obviously been everything for me. She's been through highs and lows with me and stuff and always remained, remained humble and things. And yeah, I just kind of take it back to when I was injured, to be honest. I definitely couldn't have got back if it wasn't for her as well and uh, all the hard work she did when you can't put your socks on and stuff and need help going to the toilet because you can't really move and, and things like that. So no, she's been great and obviously very lucky to have her. After your first ACL, I think it was nine months on the sidelines, you returned in September 2019. 
how did you feel when you returned? Did you feel like you had to change anything about the way you played to try and avoid re- re-injury? Were you nervous or was it sort of business as usual, straight back out there? And yeah, the, I think if there was any, when you come back from, from a knee injury like that, there's not just physical guidelines, there's mental as well. So you've got to make sure, they've got to be 100% sure you're ready in your mind to play again. And yeah, I was definitely ready, I think. Um, so yeah, I had a pre-season, not pre-season game, a friendly game against QPR before I went for the Everton game and there was like a 50-50 challenge and I just absolutely nailed someone in front of the gaffer and yeah he's pulled me into the office the next day and said oh I think um, for the weekend I thought he was going to say you'll be on the bench and he said oh I'm going to start you so then I was like oh my god and then I was really excited and yeah a little bit I would say a little bit nervous but I enjoyed it For various reasons 2019-20 was a season to forget not just because of relegation how tough was that to take you know for you as, as players? It was yeah, it was tough because obviously it was COVID and everything, and it was just a, it was a strange way to get relegated. It didn't feel when we were back and playing and stuff, and you no know, fans and everything. Um, yeah, it was just a weird time. It's, if, it, it's it's hard to put a, a a reason why we went down. Obviously, the start of the throughout the season we were getting the results we needed, but after COVID and everything, it was a bit like a not a fake league, but it just didn't feel real. You know what I mean and. Obviously, it was a massive shame for us all to, to go down and we'd put the hard work to get back up, I'd say. Was it weird playing behind closed doors? For me, it was all right, because like I say, when I played in the youth team at England, it was a lot of games were not behind closed doors, but not many fans there at all. So I'd been in that environment before and yeah, it just felt like you were back in the uh, under-18s team playing playing football, but it was strange. You miss the fans and we definitely realised that. As if re- relegation wasn't bad enough, March 2021, you do ACL again. What was going through your mind? And, you know, for you, did you ever think, this is me done, you know, it's happened again, how am I going to get back from this? Or was it, I've done this before, I know what I need to do to get back and I'm going to get back? Yeah, it wasn't ideal, to be fair. It wasn't, uh, yeah, when it happened, I just definitely knew it had gone again. So, yeah, it was, uh, I don't really know how I dealt with it. It just kind of had a little bit of a, a little cry the night it happened and then after that I was pretty much set to go get the surgery and just crack on to be honest I think at one stage I was thinking I didn't need the surgery I was thinking I just it felt so f- normal I think I'll just leave it and just carry on so but no I'm glad it, glad I got it sorted and look when I look back on my two rehabs I look back on it positively I, I know it sounds weird but obviously the first few weeks are horrible then I kind of enjoyed the process enjoyed getting better and hitting little milestones and I'm definitely stronger from it. Now, there's one moment that you've talked about before that I just want to ask you about again because I just think it's brilliant. When, obviously, you've done your second ACL, you sat there in the changing room and you've written on your phone, in your calendar, ACL recovery, like my first game back. So, obviously, at that point, you hadn't had any scans. There was nothing confirming it was an ACL, but in your mind, you knew what you'd done. And in the end, you were, what, a week out? Yeah, I definitely could have played that game as well, but... No, yeah, I don't know. I don't I really don't know why I did it. I just got my calendar out on the game ready. Literally just came off the pitch about five minutes before. And yeah, I think I went to the toilet and I was walking and it was twinging and I just knew again that I'd definitely done it. So I just got my calendar out, like you say, put a date in. So this is when I'm going to be back and it was two months before the last one. And yeah, just, is it manifest? I manifested it and yeah, probably could have been about a month and a half earlier as well. <laughs> Lou, we've all watched relentless a few times the uh, the club documentary which was brilliantly put together a real insight into your painstaking rehab and you know very private moments as well not going to ask you to sort of go through all that again but just how did you sort of feel about when you were asked by the club would you mind doing this we're going to follow you around there's going to be camera all the time how did you feel about that yeah I think first of all you just got to say the media team how well they did um, I think obviously everyone's a collective but Gribbo did uh, unbelievable job he worked incredibly hard and all the editing and stuff but yeah the first time he mentioned it, I didn't want to do it first first time my first rehab it was kind of mentioned and I was like no I don't want to do it second time didn't really want to do it at the start and then I thought at, when, I, when I went through it for the first time if I would have been able to see a few more of them documentaries because there's a few out there it would have helped me a lot so I kind of just thought if it helps a couple of people then I'll do it and cause I'm not really comfortable on the camera I think on the documentary kind of come out to be myself um, but not oh, probably 100% if you know what I mean 
but yeah they like i say we all came together and worked really hard and it came out really really well i was i was i was delighted with it were there any documentaries that you may have watched yourself that that spurred you on helped you through that process um i think on my first one i think bellerin might you know hector bellerin might have done a little one whereas not i not really watched many others to be honest obviously there's all the sports documentaries of people achieving success but as in injuries wise not really no no i think andy murray did one for his hip um which kind of obviously i went to go see the same person as him um but other than that no not really i've got to ask you about the uh the, the ballet piece um yeah nick came to me and said uh the physio here and just said look i've got a, a contact there and i said why 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 would i not want to go experience that it's like got a backstage pass to all the where they all train and stuff got to see all them training and see them in the gym how hard they have to work and uh, yeah it was it was a great time good experience probably wasn't the best at it at the time it was still a little bit sore i was trying to jump and they, did, they didn't really know that but it's still a little bit sore and yeah, my grand loves ballet as well, so she was uh unfortunately she didn't couldn't come. I actually asked to see if I could get her to come, but because of COVID and everything, she wasn't. And yeah, it was a different experience. Tempted to go and watch the ballet after that? Yeah, I think so. I think I'd go. It's just the amount of force they can create and how strong they all are. It's it's, it's really when you see me trying to do it, it's incredible to be honest. And especially when they get injuries themselves to get back and do all the spins and the jumps, and it's it's tough. So when you're sitting there on the settee with a pint of John Smith's watching it, <laughs> how, how do you feel when you're watching it and have you had any film offers on the back of it? First of all, I don't drink I don't drink John Smith's. I don't really drink, to be honest, just to put it out there. I've had a couple in my time. I'm not a massive drinker. Um, but no, yeah, no, was it film offers? I've had no film offers for, for ballet. Um, I had to decline. Is it Billy Elliot? So obviously I've got a commitment to football, so maybe one day but no like I say it was a fun experience and something that I'll probably never forget yeah they were good they were really good there this is a completely random one to throw in is it true that your agent used to clean Willow's boots at Tranmere probably yeah <laughs> now that's a Neil Perrett one that's been put in there so I feel like Neil might have a story to tell go on it's I don't know his name but I bumped into him and in all the celebrations oh, Martin Martin Filson yeah bumped into him and all the celebrations were going on after the forest game okay. and he said his big willow up there in the his big willow up there in the in the commentary box i said yeah he's, he's up there i said how do you know him and he said i used to clean his boots at Tranmere." <laughs> yeah he used to be there to be fair so yeah it's probably a true story yeah <laughs> oh, there you go. learn something fact. new every day don't you um anyway moving on you had plenty to celebrate over the summer just gone promotion and a wedding just tell us a little bit about tying the knot it must have been the most amazing day yeah, first of all, I think this this summer's been it's been crazy. It's been probably I'll never experience anything like it again. But yeah, the, oh, the wedding was perfect. Um, I think it was such a big build up again with the weather. It was like a three day thing, and on the the morning of the wedding, it was absolutely throwing it down. At like nine a.m., I woke up. I was having a panic up thinking because we're having like it all outside, and yeah, I was having a massive panic up. So I just went straight to the gym by myself, um, and just did a little session came out and it was it was nice and still a little bit cloudy and then once once we got there it was nice and Loretta walked out and all the clouds kind of it was really strange all the clouds kind of went away it was just perfect and now I had the best time it was only a, a, quite a small wedding with close family and friends and yeah it was something I'll never forget and I just as soon as it finished I just wanted to do it again so obviously you can't do it again in Italy wasn't it yeah in Italy in uh, Lake Como so we like, we like it there. We've been a few times and somewhere we always thought about getting married. And yeah, if, if no one's ever been, I, I do really recommend it because it's not too far away. It's a couple of hours and it's beautiful. How does it feel wearing a ring? Because I know we had our media access day the other day where, for those people who don't know, BBC, Sky, Getty, Amazon, everyone come in, they, they do the headshots. And for you, you didn't want to take your wedding ring off. No, I didn't know if you were allowed it on. I don't think you allowed jewellery, so unfortunately I had to take it off. But no, I really like wearing it. I feel like feel a bit more grown up um yeah just obviously i'm not someone to when i when i go out i don't really like some people wear rings on fingers and it looks quite good but i've never really had that not confidence but that little bit of you know i'm quite safe so whereas i've got this ring on now it's like i, I have to wear it so it's kind of a i'm wearing a ring now i look I feel quite 
quite cool. <laughs> we know you're a dog lover. Did Milo and Barney get an invite to the wedding? So we were going to take them. We ummed and ahed about it for ages because you always see these videos of people having their dogs at, at weddings and we decided not to in the end because they'd have been fine but it's like someone would have to look after them and especially for three days it was it had been a bit too much. So, no, they stayed at home. But yeah, they would have been good for them to be there. Now, a little bird tells us that you think you're the best Call of Duty player in the history of English football. Is that true? I used to be. I've, I think it was... Uh, when I was like a scholar, I was definitely up there. Yeah, I used to love it, but kind of stopped playing it as much as I used to do now. Obviously, other commitments and things, but no, I think if if I if I jump back on it now, certain ones I'd I'd still be up there definitely. You know, you can't lose it once you get to a level. Now I haven't got a clue what this means, but I've been asked to ask you, what's your kill to death ratio? <sighs> well, it depends. What on the new one? I've got no idea. I've just been asked to ask you that. How many people you'll kill? To how many you'd obviously die? I don't know. Obviously, my prime was Modern Warfare too, so I think I had about thirty days game time back in the day. You know, I was a sniper running around, quite an aggressive sniper, um, and that was when I was serious. So it must have been about two, two and a half then, which for thirty ga- thirty days game time is is high. Whereas Warzone now, I play with a few people and they're not the best, so I think it's about probably near a two. But yeah, I'm definitely not the best anymore, and especially in this team, there's a few few top players. Thanks very much for that answer. It all went straight over my head, unfortunately. So just tell us about anything else that you might do to to chill out, relax, apart from computer games and and the well, the dogs take a lot of time up, I would imagine. Yeah, I think obviously I still play a little bit of of games and things but not as much as I used to do I just like chilling out to be honest especially in pre-season like now it's just you go home put a series on go to bed go back to training so yeah sometimes I'd like to get into golf a little bit but again it's hard to find the time to play as much as as you'd like to 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 improve Um, did a bit of gardening in Covid I kind of lost lost that now (laughs) so I just go on little walks and stuff go to the coffee shop and watch TV to be fair what everyone else does there's, there's not much more to do got some fans questions coming up but the, the, the last question that, that Zoe and I would like to ask you is that Wikipedia describes you as formerly of the England national team now we know you've already overcome some major hurdles in your career proved a lot of people wrong along the way is playing for England still a burning desire of Lewis Cooks yeah I think definitely I think everyone especially when you're a like you're a Premier League player, everyone in the Premier League aspires to to do well and, and to try and get into the national team. So yeah, you've got to back yourself and I've been there once before and hopefully I can give it my best shot to try and get back there. But I always go back to the facts and say I'm just happy back playing football and, and enjoying myself, back training. Um, so that's the main thing really. And But yeah, it's probably back in the back back of my mind that obviously you want to get back to that, that level because... I feel like a lot of players when they're, they're on the game can get there. Now, as Neil said, we've got some fan questions. They're quick fire questions, so we'll always through them quickly before we, we end. Now, on Twitter, RAFCB wants to know, why did he switch from number 16 to number four? Um, just because I feel like number four was an uh, England number. So I like playing, I like playing that position. And it was, yeah, one I used to play for in England. Wayne again on Twitter who's been your most difficult opponent uh, I always say Hazard when he was at Chelsea I think oh, you can see the clips of, of him when he was at his prime so he'd just kind of drift everywhere on the pitch and one thing he'd be there next year next thing he'd be gone and yeah probably say him AFC Bournemouth in Germany in three words how would you describe your life as a professional footballer that's a great it's a loaded question it's a great question though um, three words enjoyable tough and relentless oh you took the words right out of my (laughs) mouth I can't believe it DC in Washington do you notice a bigger difference living by the sea yeah the the weather's better well the weather's better but that's not necessarily the sea because you can go to Scarborough and it's still freezing Um, yeah got a beach that's probably the main difference (laughs) George is asking who is the best midfielder you've played with now you put played with yeah 
no. I don't know. I think I have to go for someone from Bournemouth, won't I? So I don't say a local man, maybe. <laughs> Last question, Michael. How hard did you find it opening up on camera and showing a side not many get to see? Yeah, incredibly hard. That was probably the hardest thing about the uh, the documentary. When I, to be fair, I'm going to be honest. When I watch it, I really struggle to. I've, I've watched it all the way through, and it was incredible how hard everyone worked. But I quite, I find it quite hard to watch myself talk. So we all watched it together for the first time, and I was not cringed out, but like I can't, I don't really listen to my interviews and stuff. So I probably won't listen to this. I'm sorry. Um, so yeah, it was hard. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Lewis, we've really enjoyed having you here on the official AFC Bournemouth podcast. Thanks for taking the time to come and chat. We've had some brilliant stories and really enjoyed your company. Thank you. It was fun. Now, if you've enjoyed listening to our podcast, we would absolutely love it if you could like and subscribe on whatever platform you're listening on. We'd also be really grateful for any shares on social media so that other fans, if it's AFC Bournemouth related or the general football fan, can enjoy it too. Our thanks again to Lewis Cook and from Neil Perrett and myself, Zoe Rundle, Thank you for tuning in to the official AFC Bournemouth podcast.